Welcome to Menopause, Marriage and Motherhood, a podcast that's all about changing the way we view midlife and bringing the conversation about menopause out into the open. Each week we share stories, experiences and inspiration. We talk to experts on how to best navigate this time of life and find out how other people have not only survived but thrived through this time. I'm your host, Karen O'Connor. Welcome. I'm here today with Emily Barclay. She is a perimenopausal woman who spent far too long trying to get answers. She decided that if she was struggling, then so was everybody else. So she thought that she'd help people, help women like her, by bringing experts together to help everybody find their best route through this life stage. Welcome, Emily, and thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So tell me, that sounds like my story, I've got to say. And it sounds like the story of every other woman I've spoken to that's going through menopause. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to start the podcast, because nobody knows what to expect. Nobody knows what's supposed to happen. So tell me what happened with you and why you ended up doing the perimenopausal hub. I forgot to say that bit. So Emily set up a website called the perimenopausal hub. <laughs> so yeah. Yep. So when I was 39, I started getting peri symptoms. Didn't know what it was. I just knew I had crushing fatigue, weight gain, and what I could only describe as psycho bitch episodes. I think people listening will know what I mean. Um, and it, I started going back and forth to the doctor. And before this all started, I'd been training for Ironman triathlon. So I'd been the fittest I'd ever been. So the contrast was really marked. I was just like, well, hang on a second. What? I used to be able to get up and run 30 miles before breakfast. And now I can barely get up, you know. And so I went back and forth to the doctor. I must have gone. I, I I, I worked it all out. I went to the doctor 13 times over three and a half years. And eventually after having all the blood tests and the different scans and all the rest of it and trying this and being told I was stressed and being told I needed to just sleep better and being told I should exercise more I was training for Ironman you can't exercise more than that I eventually sat down with the doctor and we said right I was like right I think it's one of two things and she said oh I think it's one of two things too (laughs) Do we think the same two things? Um, And we both agreed that we thought it was chronic fatigue or perimenopause. And by this point, I'd been tracking my symptoms and I'd seen that there was definitely a sort of a hormonal link. You know, the the fatigue was worst at certain times of my cycle. The um, psycho bitch episodes were definitely, you could pinpoint when they were going to be and so on and so forth. And so I was like, yeah, well, I don't think it's chronic fatigue. I think it must be hormonal. So let's say it's perimenopause. And oh my god, I could have like skipped out of that that um, appointment because I had a word. I was so glad to have a word after having this three and a half years of just what on earth is going on with my body? Why is it changing? Why do I not recognise myself? Why am I not me anymore? And when I googled to see if I could find some support, if I could find some help, what I could do, all of those good things, everything I found was about menopause so it was for women whose periods had stopped it was for women who were in their 50s I was only 42 at this point and I felt like I didn't I didn't belong in that category I was I was still quite a long way off belonging there and I joined a few groups you know on Facebook and stuff and um, in a lot of them the women were talking about their grandkids they were talking about life things that weren't relevant to where I was if that makes sense and so I sort of, given that I had stopped training for Ironman by that point, so I had some spare time and, you know, I still had no energy. But, you know, when you've got no energy, the best thing to do is to start bringing together experts from around the globe, right? Um, so, so I thought, well, if I'm feeling lost and if I want access to people who can help me, then other people must want that as well. So let's see if we can pull together some people, put together a website and see where it goes. Um, so I started with a couple of nutritionists and mindset people, found a local doctor who's a menopause specialist, then kind of broadened the net. And suddenly I had like experts in New Zealand and Australia and Canada. And I'm like, oh, OK, well, this is interesting. <laughs> right. And then the US eventually that that took longer. 
and meanwhile the Facebook group was was growing and growing and and again with women from all around the world and I'm like okay apparently this was necessary <laughs> oops <laughs> And now, yeah, two and a half years on, we have 28,000 women in the Facebook group. It's completely crazy. <laughs> My goodness. So, yeah. It's fantastic because it is needed. I didn't even know I was, like you, didn't know I was perimenopausal. I went to my doctor and she said, oh, yeah, it's probably hormonal. You you will be going, she didn't mention perimenopause, she said you will probably be going through menopause. Here's some antidepressants. Here's some sleeping tablets. You'll be okay in a few years. There is nothing unusual about my story. That's the scary thing. I know. And that's the thing. And that's the thing with, with you know, talking about it on podcasts like this and on, on interviews and things is that everybody listening goes, oh, my God, you're describing me. And it's like, we shouldn't all be feeling like that because why do we not know about this? Like every other stage, we know that our periods are going to start and our body's going to change shape and stuff like that. So we, we're kind of prepared in a way for puberty. Then pregnancy, I've never been pregnant. I, I've never wanted children, but everybody knows that pregnancy is going to have certain difficulties and positives and all the rest attached to it. Like that's not a secret. And everybody knows that there are certain signs that you look out for if you're to know that you're pregnant or whatever. And then suddenly this whole next thing, and I've got a little quote here somewhere. Hang on. (laughs) So dictionary definition of perimenopause is the period of a woman's life shortly before the occurrence of menopause. (laughs) Shortly? (laughs) 10 years long. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I know, right? Uh, before one day, you know, with menopause being what, defined as when you've gone a, a full year without having a period. So effectively one day. So hang on a second. So it's a, it's a period in my life which is shortly before one day. Five minutes? Is it, I mean, oh, 10 years. Right. Brilliant. And then you've got the bit that goes after menopause. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, 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 but, and we're not told about it. We're not warned about it. We're not. Like I just, I mean, I, I, can, I can get very animated about this and I try to calm myself down because, you know, nobody needs that. But I, I really feel that in, in my little ideal world, which is lovely, by the way, there are unicorns and everything in my ideal world. In my ideal world, every woman, once she's sort of 16, 17, 18, maybe 22, whatever, that sort of bracket would, as a matter of course, start tracking her cycle so that she learns when she feels crap. She learns when she feels epic. She learns when she's hungry, when she's tired, when she's ratty, when she's so that she knows in, in work, when's the time to book the really important calls, when's the time to book a duvet day and so on and so forth. So she knows personally, when's the time to let everybody around her know that just, you know, bring chocolate and frankly, leave me alone. But also so that then when things start to change in her mid 30s, mid to late 30s, she already knows what normal was, because that's where a lot of us have been caught out is we we didn't really have a baseline for what normal was. We just went, something's something's different. But because I don't know what normal was, I've got nothing to track back to. So that's 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 always my big message to get out to people that if we could all just get every young woman starting tracking and getting to know her body and not feeling like she has to be a small man just accepting that she's a wonderful woman who has this amazing superpower of her cycle that has epic days and frankly crap days but but on the crap days maybe she's really good at doing admin because on the epic days she's far too excitable to do that or whatever I mean what a superpower and we all have that in us I never even considered that and and the other thing the thing for me when I hit perimenopause, I just had my fourth child. So, so I everything is changing anyway. I, I just thought, you know, I'm 40, I'm tired with the fourth kid. There's stuff going on in my life. I actually didn't even consider it until it had been going on for a couple of years. And then I'm like, this is bizarre. I thought I'd be over this by now. <laughs> but I didn't yeah. know what it was. 
And it's a missing in our world, that conversation with older women, with the older network about what we're to expect. And partly it's the old fashioned thing of it's, you know, we've got ladies problems down there. You know, it's <laughs> partly that. We don't, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. No, it, a lot of it is that. But we've split up across the globe and across the countries and we've not got that support network anymore where we can pass that information down no and also I think this is this is very much based on anecdotal evidence rather than anything sort of concrete but there we are I have observed that we're pretty much the first generation who were encouraged to have it all you know to work and to be mum and to be run the house and to do everything and that in itself has put a lot of stress onto our generation of women and, and perimenopause loves stress, doesn't it? I mean, it really likes to take stress and run with it and exacerbate it and really throw it back in your face. And so I think when you when you hear about women in our parents' generation who kind of say, oh, yeah, I just kind of sailed through it, I was fine. Now, some of that, I'm sure, is like those tales that people tell after childbirth, that no, it didn't hurt at all. Fine. Look, baby, lovely. But I think some of that is because they weren't trying to be all things to all people. So the, the peri hormone change had less to hang on to in terms of stress to throw back in their faces. That's actually because one of my close friends, she had no menopausal symptoms, but she's a really chill dude. She's a chill, she's really happy. And I just want thinking about it now, how much has that got to do with the fact that she hasn't really suffered with any symptoms? don't want to say stuff and she didn't really experience any symptoms yeah and I do think I mean because when once you actually sort of speak to women about how life is going and all the rest when they're when they're in this stage stress comes up time and time again and whether that man whether that's kind of headline stress as I kind of refer to it so moving house divorce new job you know the big stresses or whether it's just those constant background stresses of oh God, there's no toothpaste left and no one told me. And oh, the dog's just peed on the floor for God's sake. And oh, somebody broke my favourite dish. All those little things, which obviously all add up and they, in their own right, they seem completely inconsequential. And why on earth would, you know, it's the whole, it's the whole saying of don't cry over spilt milk, isn't it? But when spilling milk is the final thing, you cry over it because all those other little things have, have built up. And I think when you're going through a big headline stress thing, you know you're stressed. You 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 make allowances for the fact that, of course, this is a stressful event. But all those little day to day stresses, we don't allow for that. And because we're in this generation of having it all, those stresses are coming at us from every angle. And funnily enough, we can't bat them all off and then add some hormonal changes in there. And it's like, oh, I'm done. I'm done. Right. I mean. For me, a particular low point was a moorhen ran out in front of my car and I didn't swerve in time. And I sat and sobbed for 10 minutes. I mean, if that's not the definition of everything having got too much and then your hormones come along and smack you around the face, I don't know what is. <laughs> it's interesting what you're saying, though, because I've, I've had a few conversations lately around the same thing. about Women's hormones are not taken into account. I was talking to a naturopath yesterday. I actually had a lady on my podcast called Gabrielle Jackson, and she was a journo at the, Gar at the Guardian, and she wrote a book called Pain and Prejudice because she researched how little female hormones are actually taken into account in the medical profession. And fabulous book, great interview. She is amazing. But when I was talking to this naturopath, she was saying she was at a medical conference a few years ago. And she was sitting talking to a few male doctors and their suggestion, and they were talking about menopause, and their suggestion was, well, we'll just keep them on the pill till they hit 45 and then we'll put them on HRT. So everything just stays the same until they get to about 65 and then we'll take them off everything and no more problems. Okay. Um, did <laughs> It's just reminded me. I read something recently. I've not dug out the actual paper because reading scientific papers, my, my poor little peri brain just goes, oh, there's loads of words. Oh, oh. But there was um, 
I read an article about how, <laughs> this is just, it's laughable. Back in, I think it was in the 60s or the 70s, some research was done into the effects of declining estrogen on the body. Brilliant. They didn't recruit a single woman into the study because women's hormones are too unpredictable. Yes, that is what Gabrielle discovered, that until I think it was the late 90s or around the noughties, um, 99% of medical experiments were carried out on male subjects from rats all the way through because women's hormones stuff up the results. So yep, they don't want that. So we'll just take all the female subjects out. Then we don't have to, it doesn't mess up all our statistics. Yep. <laughs> you just, I mean, whenever I think about that, I just never know whether I should laugh or cry, really. No. No, it's just it's just terrifying. And and that whole thing influences medical school, which means, you know, I I fully understand why women get very frustrated that their doctor doesn't help them more. But their doctor is not being taught. The doctor is not armed with the information to be able to help them. And we somehow all of us somehow I don't know how we influence the people who write the um, syllabus for, for medical school, but. I'm sure we can because, you know, enough perimenopausal women (laughs) band together. We must be able to change the world. Right. But we need changing at at medical school level. It it, it shouldn't be an add on for a doctor to do because they're interested in it. A, A doctor in general practice should understand about a thing that is going to affect half of his patients. It's it is quite bizarre because menopause is an elective. I know. On on meds. Like what? Half of the population are going to experience it, and it's an elective subject. I was speaking to the doctor who is one of the experts on my on my hub, and the conversation went around the houses as conversations with me tend to. And among other things, we were talking about was a condition called transverse myelitis, which my mother has, um, which gets three hundred diagnoses a year in the UK. So it's pretty rare. And Susie, the doctor, was saying that at medical school, she learned more about transverse myelitis than she did about menopause. So in all so your research that you've done, why is that the case? Because TM affects men as well. Sadly, it's the only explanation I can come up with. It's interesting that you're confirming everything that has been my experience. I I was one of the women that had the pelvic mesh and. Oh, right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that happened around my perimenopause time as well. So I had that going on. So, but when I went, so I had, it was, it was inserted and I had two operations within two years to get it out again because it was inserted incorrectly they couldn't do it, and I went back last year and finally, 10 years after the initial operation, finally managed to get it at five-and-a-half-hour operation, three surgeons, right? And when I went to my GP to get the referral to go and see this particular gynaecologist who specialises in this kind of thing, he said, he said, just out of curiosity, because he's a former surgeon himself, he said, just out of curiosity, was the gynecologist who put in the mesh, was he a guy? And I said, yeah. And he just started chuckling. He said, you know, I will never repeat this, but in the medical profession, male gynecologists have a reputation for experimenting. They'll just try something out, see if it works. I, I just have no words for that. Which is pretty scary stuff. Like that's horror. And then I learned things from the gynecologist who actually did the repairs. Like she was saying, the pelvic floor. I didn't know this, right? Had four children, and I'm quite old now. Pelvic floor is not a solid muscle. It's actually like strands, like a hammock. You obviously know this. When you have a traumatic childbirth, which is what my first one was, forceps, um, it actually tears some of those strands away and they can't, they still don't have a way of putting them back. But nobody tells you that before you have a for- Don't ever have a forceps, anybody. They never tell you that kind of thing. The guy, 
the obstetrician who delivered my eldest by forceps actually had his foot on the table to pull out my son. And people wonder why I don't want children. <laughs> I know oh, it's just terrifying but it it's I I just I don't know I I really most of the time I managed to be very upbeat and wanting to change the world and blah 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 and every now and then I just think how have we got to 2021 and we as women are still so inferior in terms of healthcare how has that happened and Furthermore, over here in the UK, there's been a couple of quite high profile cases of women being murdered. And this is just honestly, it's it's it would be funny if it weren't so utterly awful. One of the police and crime commissioners, I don't really understand what that title means. But anyway, that's what his title was, said. So one of the one of the women who got killed, she was killed by. Um, a metropolitan police officer who was off duty, but try, but basically, in inverted commas, apprehended her under some COVID rule, and then used that as the way to get her into his car so that he could then do what he did. And this police and crime commissioner said, on record, on an interview with the BBC, she should have been more streetwise. Women should know more about the law so that they don't get um, arrested falsely. So, you know, it's our fault if we get raped and murdered. It's our fault if we have a horrific birth, despite the fact that it's the obstetrician with his foot on the table yanking the child out of you. It's our fault that we have a weak pelvic floor. That It's our fault that the... Do you know what I mean? It just... It, it continues to just be compounded that... Sorry, I'm getting onto my little sort of feminist rant here. I apologise. I, um, no, no, I never realised I was a feminist. I never realised I was a feminist until I started working in the menopause sphere. (laughs) And then it all came out. But it just terrifies me day in, day out. It just terrifies me. There was a a memory came up on my Facebook. Sorry, I'm off on a tangent here, but, but go with. Memory came up on my Facebook yesterday that I'd shared a few years ago. And it's basically it's a conversation between a police officer and a a man who's just been just reported a crime. And the man is saying. I got mugged and the police officer's like, well, yeah, but you're wearing a nice suit and people know you give to charity. So how can you say you got mugged? No one's going to believe that you got mugged. They're going to believe that you gave the money away. And it, you know, basically the synopsis of it was that. And then at the bottom they go, well, why, are you, why are you not believing me? Blah, blah, blah. The police officer goes, well, this is what you say. This is what you say to rape victims. And yeah, a lot needs to change. We just still aren't really heard and aren't actually treated as equal human beings in that that saddens me immensely it does me and when I'm going off on your tangent and when I watch what's happening particularly in the states I find it terrifying oh don't even don't even there was something I saw the other day about a woman who had and I I can't my poor little brain can't believe that this is true but I suspect it probably is a woman who has been prosecuted because she miscarried I mean (sighs) Try telling that to any woman who's ever had a miscarriage. Nobody chose it. Nobody chose to kill that baby. That was, and I'm not even going to go down the abortion thing because <laughs> that, that opens another whole kind of. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? It totally does. It's yeah. So, talk, let's get back onto track. Sorry, <laughs> this is a great meander. I love this because it's actually really relevant. If there was true equality within the medical profession and within society, this wouldn't be something that women and the rest of the population don't know about because it's not just when I was talking, I've got two boys, two girls. When I was talking to my eldest son that I was going to start this podcast and everything, he said, mum, this is brilliant because I need to know this. I need to be able to support my partner through whatever she's going to go through. And if I know what to expect, because she's just gone off the wall about something when she hits a certain age, it's like, okay, right, are we possibly talking perimenopause here? He said, I don't think I'd say that to her. But, you know, (laughs) at least I know (laughs) know what to expect. 
that hadn't occurred to me. What, what I was thinking was, I don't want my daughters to go through what I went through and what most other women in our age group are going through. I want them to be aware of what's going to happen. But the men need to know. The biggest divorce rate now is from people in their late 50s, early 60s, because guess what? Women hit menopause and all of a sudden their guys are married to somebody else and they just go, hang on. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, yeah. Oh, hang on. You're not. You're not this lovely subservient person that used to yeah. hang around. You, you've suddenly got an opinion. Whoa, there. <laughs> About educating men. That this. <laughs> this amused me a couple of years ago when I was first setting up the website. I had to speak to somebody about the whole GDPR thing. I don't know if GDPR happened I think it was a European thing, but anyway, it was all about data protection and stuff. Massively boring. But there's a guy in our village who. Well, he doesn't live in our village anymore. But there was a guy in our village who was a GDPR expert. So. I kind of collared him in the pub one evening. I went, right, need to speak to you. Let me get you a beer. Right, this is what's happening. I explained the whole thing. He's a very matter-of-fact person. So he just literally took verbatim notes of what I was saying so that he would, you know, understand it. Yeah, we sorted out the GDPR. That was fine. And um, (laughs) then the next, over that summer, like pretty much every time I went to the pub, a man, various different men, would come up to me and go, I think you might need to speak to my wife. And I'd be like, all right. Um, right. And it turned out that Sandy, the DDPR guy, had basically told the entire local cricket team <laughs> that, fellas, right, you need to know about this. Don't care if it's for your wife, your sister, your mum, your auntie, whatever. You need to know about this and you need to speak to Emily. And I was like, could we not just embrace that and pass it around the world? And yeah, I mean, one of the things I do a lot of now and I'm trying to do more and more of is corporate menopause education and the beauty of everybody being now happy to be on Zoom all the time is that men attend the webinars and learn about it, because if that was an in-person thing, no man would go into that room. No, you quite right. I hadn't even considered that. Yeah, it's telling that a lot of businesses that approach us now it's often a woman in HR who gets in touch with it with us to to sort it out but quite a few of the businesses of late have had a man host the actual event going I know nothing about this please just inform me and I'm like this is brilliant I would much rather someone hold their hands up and say I'm completely clueless please tell me than sort of go oh well <laughs> I'm just going to mansplain that at you <laughs> like no, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> so I agree entirely. And your 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 son is absolutely right. The more everybody can start to understand what's happening, the more everybody can help everybody. And the other thing is communication, because, you know, we teach. I was talking to somebody and she specializes. They've got books to help little kids, two to seven year olds communicate what they're identifying communicate what they're feeling their emotions and everything we don't know how to communicate what we're going through well we really don't one friend came up with this fabulous idea when she realized that she was probably going to be going through perimenopause she sat her family down and she said if I walk out my bedroom in the morning and say I am not fit for human consumption ignore everything that comes out of my mouth and if possible, stay out of my way. And this is one. This is something. So this is something I advocate all the time. I always advocate, as I've said earlier, that that women track their cycle. But I also advocate that that their family be brought in on this. So together they start, and, and certainly all the more so if you've got teenagers in the house as well. Get tracking everybody's cycle, frankly, because then you can see. Oh, and keep an eye on the full moon as well. Once you've got all of those things, then actually everybody in the family knows when to just come armed with chocolate and then keep away when to have a good big family discussion when mum's going to be great fun and sister's going to be great fun because frankly those days aren't always going to be the same but actually it's back to that superpower if we all just embrace the superpower and harness it then we can all we can all kind of muddle along much more happily (laughs) whereas for as long as we don't talk about it it's like oh it's her time of the month, it, you know, said in a very kind of disparaging way. That doesn't get us any further forward. That, that again, puts the blame on the woman. 
<laughs> does, doesn't it? You know, it, this is really great because I hadn't identified that it is all about blaming and what's the word? Disempowering. Totally disempowering, isn't it? Well, yeah, you only have to look at the language that we use. You know, a man will be an assertive, a woman will be bossy. Mm. And and so on and so forth. The language all is there's a great <laughs> I'm off on a tangent again, sorry. There's a great page on Facebook called Man Who Has It All, right? I would recommend every single woman and man looks at that page because what they do is they take things like um magazine headlines and they switch it to being about men. And when you read it, it's so ridiculous when it's about men that you then start to unpick it about women. So it's things like, men, have you got up at 4.30 to make the kids lunch and steam wash your testicles and do some yoga and make sure you've got no wrinkles? Don't forget to drink some more water. Smile. And and once you put that at men, you know, it just, it's so funny. And the the humour just goes such a long way with it. And what's lovely is that on the page, the the followers of the page all get the humour. So the comments section is priceless. Everybody should look at that. (laughs) I've nothing to do with it. I just think it's hilarious. We'll put the link up on the video. I'll put the link up (laughs) while you're talking. New South Wales has just got a new premier. And he's just announced that he's, honest to God, he's a 1960s pin-up boy. It's not good. But he's just announced that his wife is expecting their seventh child. So some of the reporters did ask him how he was going to balance his home work life with having so many young children around the house. And it was interesting seeing how he responded to that. Mm. Yeah, because he won't have expected to be asked that. It's it's the same when you look at, you know, interviews with celebrities or whatever. You, hey, Daniel Craig, how's the new James Bond film? Great, thanks. Yeah, la, 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 la. Hey, Kira Knightley. No, she hasn't got kids, has she? But, you know, insert name of celebrity female with kids. Hey, so-and-so, how's the film? And, oh, how did you manage filming away while you have children? It's a real double standard, yeah. It's, it is, it is. And and it's it's just everywhere. <laughs> There's a, there's a wonderful book actually called Invisible Women by a lady called Caroline Criado Perez. And yeah, every everyone should have a read of that. And it, it just looks at the data. There's no emotion in it. It's not, I know I bring a lot of emotion into it and a lot of anger into it and stuff like that, but she just looks at the data and it's fascinating how the data shows that the bias is there. I know that one statistic that really shocks me is 70% of chronic pain sufferers are women. They're not men because women tend to be ignored. Their symptoms aren't dealt with. They're dealt with, oh, it's, you know, here's some antidepressants, it's all in the mind, and it goes on and on and on for years. Yeah, we're just hysterical. Mm. emotional (laughs) I know it's good isn't it so we're going to wrap up in a minute because my internet is getting dodgy your picture (laughs) is going a bit blurry and I'm looking at it going oh (laughs) (laughs) I hope there's not but when because sometimes when it's in the cloud the recording actually comes out better than it looks for me right now but I I never know until I actually download it (laughs) (laughs) So tell me about the perimenopause hub, what people can find there and how to how to menopause brain. Yeah, <laughs> how to find it. <laughs> find it. That's Look, the word. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so the website is perimenopausehub.com because I like to keep things very simple because we all know that in perimenopause, we can't do complicated. There's no dots or dashes or hyphens or numbers or anything. It's just perimenopausehub.com. And then the Facebook group is just search perimenopause hub on, on Facebook and you'll find us. And I'm also on Insta and Twitter, but I very rarely use them. So it's probably not worth mentioning. (laughs) 
I'm so. <laughs> but yeah, the Facebook, the, the sorry, the website has got loads of interviews with the experts, um, lots of information about the experts, lots of um, articles by them, and lots of just a, a wealth of information. And then on the Facebook group, there's peer-to-peer support, but also support from the experts as well. So it's a nice mix of serious and lighthearted. Frankly, you know, when when I find that it's all getting a bit too serious on the group, then I just ask to see people's pets because because pets. (laughs) Distraction. Oh, yeah. Oh, animals. Brilliant. (laughs) I'm I'm generally quite immature, so I I, I do I think humour has to be in there. I think if we if we get let ourselves get bogged down with quite how crap we might be feeling on a day to day basis, then we'll never get through it. Whereas actually, if we find humour in it, and some of the ladies in the in the Facebook group have just wonderful senses of humour, and some of the posts that get put in there, you just think, wow, I just read that. That was brilliant, and people are comfortable to talk about it, which is lovely, and so. You know, it's a nice, safe place. And even with a ridiculous number of women in there, it's still a safe place. So that's that's good. Which is great because that's the really important thing, being able to talk to somebody who's not going to judge you and you can just offload to them and go, I had a really crap day. I'm going to kill the kids. And just have people go, yeah, I totally get it. <laughs> that's invaluable. It, it is. And the number of people when they first join the group who go, oh, my God, I thought I was going mad. I'm so I'm so glad I found you. And it's like it, it saddens me. I mean, I'm, I'm very glad that, that I've created the resource and, it, and it's I'm very glad it's helping people. But it really saddens me. And this obviously ties in with everything we've said. It really saddens me that that people are still feeling like that and, and needing to make posts like that because. Like that's just horrible that people are feeling so alone until they find us but then once they found us then they're not alone so that's good <laughs> it is and we can only do one step at a time we can only impact one person and and then it grows from there because it, it is always awful when I hear other women's stories and like, oh my gosh I just want to be in among people that know what I'm talking about and know that I'm not insane like I I hear so many people saying they thought they were going mad they were just losing it yep that's such a common thing and I hear it so often and with you know the the crippling anxiety people suddenly go well hang on a second I used to be able to function like a human being and suddenly I can't even get in my car because it's terrifying and being dismissed I'm not going to start ranting again because I've done enough of that but yeah so we are there as a lovely welcoming safe place the there's a lot of information on the website and there's always someone to chat to on the Facebook group oh that's lovely it is really great what you're doing thank you so much it is it's so needed and yeah support anybody that can do that good on you well thank you for having me it's been brilliant to like just I know it's stuff <laughs> oh it's great and we like just those, but those tangents are actually really important because it's relevant to where we end up. That's the scary thing because we don't even think about it till we go, hang on, how did, why is this happening right now? And then we start to unravel it. Well, and you never know, we might start recruiting our army of perimenopausal women to change medical education. I think that's a definite doable one. I think we should, you know. A global army of perimenopausal women? I wouldn't stand up against us. <laughs> Not if they knew how scary we are. <laughs> I mean, only once. <laughs> yep. Yep. No, it's good. I actually marched into a clothes shop that I go to and turns out one of the shop assistants is at med school. And I said, well, <laughs> turn, let me tell you. <laughs> menopause the week before. And I'm like, excellent. Let's have a chat. <laughs> I think the responsibility that each of us has is to be open about it and to talk about it. And I think we just have to lead by example and say, look, it's a female body. It isn't something to be sort of afraid of or to make taboo. This is happening to my body and to her body and to her body and to her body and to her body. And actually, we're half the population. So let's just talk about it. Let's let's stop being embarrassed about talking about vaginal issues or breast issues or whatever it's just a body part you know if you go to the doctor doctor couldn't care less if he's looking at your hand or if he's looking at your 
cervix you know it's just a body part and I think the sooner we can normalize that and just be comfortable talking about it and be okay with it and not keep changing the language to soften it for for other people's delicacy I think the more we can do that then the more we can really bring about bring about change yeah it's like there is nothing wrong you are this is supposed to happen there's nothing wrong it's like you have a drink you need to go to the toilet that's <laughs> just what your body does it's the yes. other bookend of puberty you have puberty you have this and then you got that and then it's and it's it's just a bodily function if you if you were ringing in sick to work because you'd been vomiting all night you wouldn't sugarcoat that would you you'd just say I can't come in because I've been vomiting all night. But somehow, if you can't come in because you've got crippling period pains and you've been doubled over and you're flooding every half an hour, you feel you shouldn't say that. But actually, it's every bit as inconvenient and uncomfortable and horrible and unpleasant. And actually, you should be able to say, sorry, my body is not playing today and I I can't be there. Yeah. Jeez, you brought up a lot of stuff for me. Thank you. I I know. I didn't expect to. (laughs) I just you know talk a bit about the hub (laughs) but uh, apparently apparently I'm quite angry today so (laughs) there we go one of those days have you been keeping your diary (laughs) yeah and it's not even one of those days I mean watch out world on those days (laughs) we'll have to do it let me know when it's one of those days we'll do another Uh, uh, that'll be so much fun (laughs) believe me the language would be a lot worse (laughs) all right I'm explicit it's fine (laughs) Uh, thanks so much Emily I really appreciate it it's so good to meet you thank you for having me it's been great thanks for joining us this week on menopause marriage and motherhood make sure you subscribe to the show on your favorite player and while you're at it we'd love you to leave us a rating on iTunes or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show that would be amazing too Be sure to tune in next week for the next episode. And remember, if you're busy thinking about what you can't have, how on earth are you going to enjoy what you can have? See you next week.